got a little treat, a little bonus for all of us. It is my pleasure to invite back to this stage Professor Carl Friston, together with Travis Oliphant. Carl, Travis, please. Thank you. You missed me, Carl. I <laughs> you did. Thought, you I thought you were done, <laughs> but... This is the moment where I allow myself to put my science geek hat, because the one thing that I know about these two gentlemen is that they are at the core of open source products, solutions, that I've been using as a scientist and also as an entrepreneur. As a neuroscientist, I used SPM, which is a package to process brain data, put simply, that Carl gave to the world. And as an entrepreneur, someone who codes, I've used a lot of the packages that uh, Travis has given the open uh, source community. Uh, too many to list, but uh, there are a lot. I mean, Python is the obvious one. And I wanted to bring you guys together because I'm not sure people know that you were involved with neuroscience at some point and that you used some of uh, the things that Travis did. So let's start with you. What's this thing with yeah. you and neuroscience? A lot of people don't realize I got into Python because I was at the Mayo Clinic studying biomedical Im imaging and actually did a rotation through a neuroscience lab as well. I thought I might become a neuroscientist, but I was terrible in the lab. I glued the gel paper to the, in the wrong way and messed up this, the centrifuge but I fixed their computer. <laughs> so I just, I better stick with my lab with what I know and not the wet lab work. But I worked under a professor, Richard Robb, who had built a software package called Analyze that was one of the first medical imaging and scientific imaging packages that was widely distributed to scientists. It turned out, I just found out that Carl used that library. So it was a, a interesting uh, serendipitous uh, synchrony, synchronicity. <laughs> so I was in my late 20s and I just finished my medical training and it was my very first re, uh, research job and the very first bit of software I used was, was analyzed analyze. from, from, from Richard Rob. Robb. And he yeah. was a, a mentor of mine when, when I was getting my PhD. And I think it's an opportunity to, to stress how important uh, open source and open science are mm -hmm. because a lot of the technology that is built today that you're using has been, wouldn't exist without people sharing their code, without people sharing their science. We hear a lot about AI being monetized and the financial impact, especially here in Davos, which makes sense. But all of this would not exist without people giving their time, effort, and when I say people, it's com entire communities. Mm -hmm. Because for what you develop, for SPM, the community of neuroscientists was sending feedback and plugins, and we all been benefiting from this with thousands and thousands of scientific publications and thousands and thousands of products. So you share in common to have contributed to the community and we shall all be very grateful about that. But Carl knows it, you started to know me a bit better. I'm sure there are points where you guys disagree. <laughs> not yet. You got, you, not yet? Well, <laughs> this is why I'm here with you. It will probably take another two hours before we oh, go to that part of the, I'm, part of the I'm conversation. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> So the, what I want to ask you, you wanted to be a neuroscientist, but even if you don't have a title, I've spent hours speaking to you about the brain and you deserve a title. Uh, what is the way you, as a computer scientist, see the brain? Do you see it as a processing machine? Do you see it as a dynamical system? What is your, your approach to, to uh, brain and cognition? That's an interesting question. I, I guess I'm, I, I see it as a, I'm, as a student trying to understand. Ah. So I'm still trying to understand what it is, right? It's, it's a biological, uh, complex, dynamical system that, uh, that, cert that I have myself certain um, experiences with. I can see it in my own life, and then I can observe my own experiences. Then I can also see it in others. And, I can, and so it's this, this experiment I'm in the middle of. And I love um, the neuroscience I've studied. I, I did a lot of... Uh, I've done a lot of lay reading about the brain and how it works. 
and we were sharing some of our common interests in that direction. I believe it's a, it, the more we understand about how our brain works, the better we can do lots of things. I'm a parent of six children, and actually my neuroscience studies, I think, help me understand my children as I watch them grow. For example, uh, every child goes through this, um, so that's why stage. Mm. And it's, it helped me understand that we do the same thing. And, and I sometimes call it our baloney generator. We all have something, we, we have to make sense of the world. And I watched my kids do the same thing. They'd see some event, they'd see, oh, the light turns on when somebody comes in the room. And they'd immediately come, oh, that's why. You know, that's why Santa Claus goes down the chimney because of this. And it's like our brains have to be constantly creating a model of the world. Even though it's wrong, and it will be, and I realized, oh, I'm doing the same thing. Speaking of a model of a world, we have a V-Man who basically that. created the model of a world. But, but I'm fascinated we can get better at it, though. And I think we can get better at creating a model of the world. Yeah, but the only, I mean, what is also very interesting to me is someone who's revered uh, the way he is in the world of science, beyond neuroscience like Carl, making, no offense, uh, the switch to... Uh, out of academia into business late in your career and seeing that all these pieces that we learn from the work of Carl in neuroscience are tying up in yeah. what Versus does, in what Google yeah, DeepMind does, in what everyone does, because at the end of the day, I would love neural to nets, hear, guys. If I could get, I mean, Carl, I'm, I would love to hear how your system works. I really would love to hear that because I don't feel like I've, I've heard an explanation. And I would love to hear your explanation of how your system works and, and what it does. Your geeks out there, this is for you. <laughs> and I can answer as a scientist. <laughs> please yeah, answer it as please. a scientist. This is we'll not the moment later. where you're going to speak to an eight-year-old. Right, thank you. Um, although I think eight-year-olds are, are, are important things to speak to in terms of... Um, remember at the end of our conversation, I said aha moments, the thing I couldn't live without. Absolutely. I think when that... You know, when that awareness that childlike delight and say ah that's how it works mm -hmm. that's what i meant by the aha moment so that for me is a manifestation of how we continually and specifically our children build their world models and build their generative models they are little scientists mm -hmm. trying to discover their world um, you know very much along the lines that you described your brain mm -hmm. trying to understand the world and what's the most important part of the world well, it's me. Um, so I'm trying to understand myself. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to understand myself? Well, in order to disambiguate, disambiguate me from you. And so I think there's something quite fundamentally mm -hmm. social about the lived world that we're trying to emulate and to install in our generative models that has a distinction between self and other. We were talking about the James yes. Anderson cell. Yes. You know, and I was going to ask you, well, now think about the me cell and the difficulties of representing myself without going into Gödel. We don't want to... Uh, We're getting into the concept of consciousness and is it, 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 what does it represent, but it might be in this direction, perhaps. Oh, I've just got, I've got a look from him, so <laughs> back to the question. Um, <laughs> so the way that you'd, um, you'd, you'd uh, put this into a com bit of computer science is to say, okay, the agenda is to build a world model I call that a generative model in exactly the spirit that you were talking about, generating explanations for that's how it works. How do you build a generative model? You have to work out the mechanics of belief updating uh, as you accrue that knowledge and you make inferences about the world. So there's a lot of stories about predictive processes and predictive coding from the inference perspective, a lot of uh, stories about learning the parameters of that generative model, say, uh, you know, weights in a transformer architecture. The, the both, basically, aspects of belief updating, Bayesian beliefs in the way that we were talking about them before. How do you do that? You just have to build a graph, a network. Mm -hmm. You can always articulate a generative model as a, as a graphical model, a probabilistic model, again, with this uncertainty imbued in it because we're talking about a graph that where each node is basically a belief structure, probability distribution. Then you convert that into a message passing scheme by, for every graphical model, there is a factor graph. The factor graph gives you the message passing scheme for the computer scientist. And then it's a question of just finding the right software. And I have to say that we have identified NumPy and Python as a very <laughs> apt kind of software to do that message passing on the right kind of factor graphs whose structure 
is the world model and therefore will be unique to this agent who's building a model of her world. Okay. And that's how you do it. That's Very beautiful. Simple. Yeah. The, I appreciate that. <laughs> and those who may, um, if you didn't, let's keep talking. I, I really appreciate that. That was the, the, the most succinct explanation I've heard for a long time. Well, this is Carl. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is, is Carl. Carl. There should be drinking games when you <laughs> listen to Carl whenever he says Bayesian. Really? So I love Bayesian. <laughs> I'm, I, I've studied statistics for, that's another one of my passions is statistics, but I actually prefer it to be called probability theory because I believe, uh, and as Bayes' ah. rule, is essentially how you reason about uncertainty. And, you know, Richard Koch's theorems, if you've studied those, I'm sure, uh, he proved that uh, under a certain set of conditions, uh, that Bayes' rule follows logically from just a, if you want to reason about uncertainty consistently with numbers then effectively you end up with Bayes' rule. So it's not just something that you, it's, it's actually a mathematically consistent approach to reason about uncertainty. So that's very powerful because, uh, you know, mathematics, I love mathematics, but I'm also recognized mathematics is simply logical thought from, from starting points. You gotta pick the starting points because you can talk about anything you want from any starting point. That's why you can get math to lie because you can hide the starting points from people and then the logic will follow, but you just, don't remember that this was the starting point. You actually don't believe that starting point. But anyway, I, this is what I think. The more we understand about how the brain works, the more we build systems that allow intelligent thought, we can do amazing things for the world. LLMs aren't there. So I actually share that belief, that view. The LLMs are not there. They're amazing tools. That's why I'm fascinated by neuroscientists who are bringing more understanding of how the brain actually works to the, to the world. I'm curious if you can do this in parallel, because of course, the, what made transformer architectures work today is the massive parallelism, and then uh, and the ability to do then update m uh, massively. Because in the past, these sequential Bayesian models have been uh, harder to program; mm. they've been hard to update. The parallelism isn't there, and so that, I'm curious if that's um, if there if, it's, if that's been solved or if that's being solved, or what do you what do you what do you think about just the difficulty of the math of uh, computationally updating at scale these models? Yeah. Um, so just to can I just take a second oh, to reinforce? Oh, yes. You know, it's the end of the conference, and this is the moment where I'm thinking about having labels on the talks. You know, uh, for everybody, science geek only. Super science geek only, <laughs> and I let you guess in which category this conversation falls. I mean, bring me popcorn, I can be here for two hours. I love it. So we have a latitude to go wherever we want. Yeah, for the next three minutes, sure. <laughs> I, I knew there were boundaries, there were always boundaries. Um, but just that point, yeah, when I say Bayes, I mean probability theory. Yeah. And, you know, I, I could equally sort of um, reiterate what you just said about finding the right starting points, that's exactly what people, uh, well, yeah. certainly people like myself and Gabe and people at Nurses mean by applying a first principles. Yeah. You have to get the principles right. One of my favourite principles is actually James, E.T. James's yes. maximum calibre, minimum yes. engine. That is exactly what I mean by Bayes or what we mean by We're Bayes. We're in the same boat, love yeah. it. <laughs> it's just the same it's probabilistic beautiful. description of the yeah. world. This is the only way that you measure your world, you observe your world, you engage with your world. This is the ultimate first principle mm. account. So in fact, the free energy principle is actually dual to James's maximum caliber principle or principle of um, um, minimum path um, um, entropy, which is the, the same as the principle of least action we were talking about, the most yeah. efficient way of doing it. It's all the same thing. All the same thing. It's all the same thing. Beautiful. The large language model thing, I think that, you know, the nice thing about the large language model, they have taken a baby step towards a neuromimetic architecture by putting a, a tension heads in. Yeah. So they've, they've got a, you know, a, a baby step towards sort of um, contextualizing. A baby difference. step within a massive uh, uh, engine. A parallelism. A very data. big engine. <laughs> bigger the better, apparently. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, well, is bigger better? Well, you, you <laughs> clearly no. Uh, you know, it, it is. It is that delicate structure and, and the, you know the architecture of these graphical models, the ensuing photographs that make us what we are. Uh, you know, destroying convolutional neural networks or something is um, L, 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 
functional forms to your updating without any uncertainty, without any beliefs under the hood, that, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere. Beautiful. Just final question, personal interest. I had a conversation with my daughters recently. I'm advising old books for them to understand today's world. And there are two books that I advise them. One is The Invisible Man that explains a lot the behavior of people on social media. The other one is Frankenstein, who clearly could have been uh, written today with trying to recreate God. Um, throughout your careers, are there books that are non-scientific books that are really influenced the way you think and that have benefited you as scientists? Uh, something from the literature, or else, Carl. <laughs> um, so I was about to say all my favorite books, but they're all scientific of a sort. Non-scientific. <laughs> non -scientific, yeah. It has to be non-scientific. Yes. Oh. Anything non-scientific that's really shaped your thoughts? Or... Yeah. The Hobbit. The Hobbit. <laughs> okay. I don't know why, though. Yeah. <laughs> all right. This Sorry? might not be uh, uh, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, actually. <laughs> has been a, a how, uh, which got me interested in business, actually. The reason I migrated from science to business was actually the influence of uh, economic thinkers like him. Yeah, the reason I ask is, again, because I always end up on a very analog note, but also because I see too many scientists or tech people who are single-minded towards what they're doing and do not take the step, uh, you know, aside just to learn from different forms of art, etc that shape our brain and benefit everybody. The reason I'm saying that also is for you out there who are non-geeks and think that this was not a conversation you were expecting. Listening to people who have this amount and wealth of experience and who can take a step back and provide a view, an helicopter view or a microscopic one on what is happening today in AI, is really, really a gift to me and I hope to all of you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you.